All right, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Uh, welcome here. Uh, right, so a topic uh, for me for the next 20 minutes is going to be building a data lake at a bank. Um, so what I'm going to start with basically is a quick introduction, like what Solaris is, data lake, what are we going to do there, why are we doing this? Um, and then I really want to spend the remainder of the presentation talking about what's special doing that at a bank. And I guess you can all guess, uh, bank, financial services, heavily regulated industry. So I want to talk a bit about uh, regulation then and what are the particular challenges arising from that. Um, I guess that's something that you find a little advice uh, on the internet all the time. So I hope I can close this gap at least a little bit uh, with this. Um, Talking about regulation, of course, is a somewhat broad topic. So I thought for this presentation, I'm going to pick everybody's darling of uh, this year, which is going to be general data protection regulation. So a lot of buzz around it. Probably you had lots of emails in your inbox lately for all the sorts of consents you have to give now. Um, so I'm mainly going to focus a little bit on that, um, going through what are the challenges, what could be possible solutions for that. Um, OK, starting with that, what is Solaris Bank? Basically, Solaris Bank is a fintech company from like right around the corner here, so two stations per subway. Um, and what it allows to do is uh, for other companies to play bank, kind of. So as another company, you don't really have to be a bank, but you still want to offer some banking-like products, like you want to offer accounts to somebody. Um, then Solaris Bank comes in as a fully licensed bank, so to say, from a regulatory perspective and it offers its services not directly to customers, but as an API to other businesses, which can then in turn uh, offer these kinds of financial products or integrate these things into their own products and build stuff around it so that uh, they can really focus on the real products of theirs and uh, not too much on all the burden of getting the regulation right, which has been done only once in the core of Solaris Bank. And as you can imagine, um, at one point or another, there's lots of stuff going on in a the bank. There's lots of various products that banks offer. You have accounts, you have credit cards, you have loans and deposits and whatnot. Um, so the company is growing. It's growing a lot. Uh, I think the company is somewhat like two years old and already has 170, 180 employees. There's, there's a lots, of, lots of products popping up somewhere, and you've got to get your data under control somehow. So if you have business intelligence people, if you have data scientists working there, then initially things might be very easy. You just attach to the database and you get your stuff. But as soon as you have more teams working with different databases, different database technologies, things really get very painful for the people because then you never know where to get your data from. You have to attach to a new system every day. And then what used to be one system before is now three systems because things were split up. And then you attach to three new databases and everything gets crazy. So. The big problem here is if you have on the back some data scientists checking the risk position of the bank or doing whatnot, or business intelligence people generating reports for the management or for regulatory entities or whatnot, things are really in flux a lot and things can get out of hand unless you somehow professionalize the whole data processing a little bit, which is why the decision was taken to build some sort of data lake which should make exactly this easy. So some place where we can say we put all these data sets that we have and there's a team dedicated to making sure they're available there. And from there on, we have kind of a unified technical interface and a unified way of uh, like managing the access to this whole thing. You don't have to adapt to all sorts of new technologies all the time. And there's always this one guy who can at least give you access. Of course, there might be other people you might have to ask for permission. But still, there's this one place to, to, to govern this. A um, bit of the technologies we have there and what we're building. So mainly what we have is, for instance, like MySQL databases. We have CSV files somewhere. We have other databases and so on um, that the various teams, the product teams that Solaris use. And what we then do is we build some simple export tools that, like one way or another, make this thing somehow pop up at our uh, data lake, which is currently living in the cloud. So ingestion there basically means we have some Kinesis streams open where we can put the data, whatever kind of data that is you dump that data inside and beforehand announce that you are exporting this particular data set uh, to us. There's some kind of catalog running in the uh, data lake where then you recognize that was this stuff that you export, like this data set, it had this schema currently. Uh, everything gets transformed to, to Avro files currently, maybe later to Parquet files as well. Um, and eventually the things will be put into S3 kind of, which is then the data lake, so our blob storage for all sorts of files that end up there. Um, and then they are properly tagged with metadata and everything else that you need to later on manage the access and to make sure nothing gets lost. Um, 
From there on, basically, the word finance, it works in batch processing. So kind of like there's things you have to do every day, there are things to do every month or every year. Um, so that's basically what we do afterwards. We have, for instance, the data scientists and running their own Luigi there. They're running a few jobs um, and get their reports out of that or their models out of it. Um, so that's, that's the basic thing we built there. I guess that should be uh, fairly familiar to most of you, uh, given the audience of that conference. Um, so that's pretty much the whole idea. The purpose behind this, making it easy for the people who do these batch processing jobs to get their data and to not have them running around asking for credentials and permission all the time, but finding one structured way to govern and access this, which is important also because otherwise you have to explain and document all the time all these various ways in which you give access and where you give access and how and what to manage and so on and why that is secure. So we need this one way of doing that and that makes things fairly easy. Then it comes uh, GDPR regulation. So this was the basic architecture Main idea pretty clear, I hope. Um, what do you have to do for this thing to be compliant? And then I have to give my uh, regular disclaimer here. This is danger zone. I'm a software engineer. I'm talking about legal topics here. So probably most of it is wrong. If you go down to the very big detail, ask your lawyer before. I don't know too much about law. So I don't even know if this disclaimer is worth anything. I have no idea. So uh, really ask your lawyer. But uh, these, are, these are my things. And I guess uh, that bunch of typical requirements, they come from things like data protection, they also come from kind of other laws all the time, other regulation that you do, uh, and things that you as a software engineer probably understand fairly easily. It's no problem if you do that upfront. If you, somebody tells you upfront you have to encrypt everything in transit and in REST, you can build your system according to this rule. It should be doable most of the time. Of course it takes work, of course some technologies might not fit very well together, but um, that is always something, you know, this requirement comes in, it's easy to build. Other requirements, easy to build. Strong authentication, multi-factor authentication, a big thing all the time, everything has to be protected by multi-factor authentication. There's logins to various things like an AWS console, like other tools you use, like GitHub and so on. Um, SSH also, and all these kinds of things, MFA, super important. Auditability, that is uh, some very important topic where you can do a lot and it's not easy to get right. Um, but at least you know what to do. It should be possible all the time uh, to know exactly who created which kind of change to your environments, where. And I think uh, that's where automation, uh, like automate everything is really your, your key principle there and then it works. So for instance, what's super uh, nice with AWS and these cloud services is you can put not only your actual software under version control, but also the state of your infrastructure with tools like AWS. And then if you roll that out automatically, you have this wonderful kind of audit trail of which change you did and then if it was applied and if it was not applied correctly, you have all sorts of locks that's important. Um, other topics, clearly role separation of concerns. It shouldn't be possible for a single person to steal any money or bring the company down or something. So it's important to early on define various roles and ideally split them up between people so that the blast radius of a single person doing harmful things or even mistakes is fairly small. Um, in terms of data, I guess pseudonymization, before you do any analytics or something like that, it's super important you pseudonymize your data, which basically means you put out everything that directly identifies a person, like a name, ideally birth dates or something, maybe also uh, I don't know, social security numbers or whatever you might have, um, and replace everything with a pseudonym that ideally only exists in this analytics space. So ideally a new ID that doesn't pop up in any of your transactional databases, but a new ID, then at some place you can lock down the mappings between the various production IDs and that pseudonym that you use in analytics, and then everything is relatively safe, I would guess. Um, and then, of course, lots of other IT security measures you got to get right. So talking about network security and all these kinds of things. Um, that's always what I call the somewhat easy part. Easy, not because it's easy to build, but because it's if, like, if you're told that up front and if you know it, then it's cool. If somebody tells you two years into the project you have to do these things, then, of course, it's a big, big problem. Um, but uh, like, if you're careful, these things are cool. And then comes the rest of the GDPR. Um, and that, to me, always looks pretty much like this. So 
you have like meetings with lawyers and then uh, you talk about what you're going to do and of course like people who study law don't really know too much about technology and you having like ideally studied and worked in technology don't know too much about the law and you end up talking about a long list of special cases at least what it feels like to me so you have this thing and this thing and this thing and you always kind of start from scratch explaining what it does and, and eventually I don't know it's 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 difficult I would say so um, that's kind of the sad part about this whole thing, I think, that uh, most of the requirements, like what are we allowed to do, are we doing this the right way, and so on, um, it, it always gets lost in translation, I have sometimes the feeling. And uh, every time you walk out of uh, the meeting with a lawyer, so before joining Solaris, I worked at Finley, which is a uh, fintech company builder, so I had also various other occasions where these law topics uh, played a role also in the initial design of the system. It's always a challenge to, to work out what the real requirements are, what you're allowed to do, and to get through these meetings without getting lost in too much detail, technical detail that might not be relevant. Um, so at some point, maybe you get so frustrated that you have to have a look into the law yourself, even though you're not an expert for it. And it's a sad situation, but at uh, some rainy Sunday afternoon, I think I sat on my couch and flipped through 156 pages of GDPR and I found this wonderful article. It says Article 25, Data Protection by Design and by Default. And then you read through it and there's a lot of blah, blah, blah in the beginning. And then at some point it says, implement appropriate technical and organizational matters. Then comes a lot of other blah, blah, blah. And then it says, uh, which are designed to implement data protection principles. Then even more blah, blah, blah. And then it says to integrate the necessary safeguards in the processing in order to meet the requirements of this regulation, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I liked it because it says like implement and implement and implement everywhere and integrate and, and do this directly during the processing and I thought well, maybe that's what we have to do. Maybe it's not so sad after all because maybe we can somehow build this into our system uh, and then it's right. That would be my dream. Uh, so maybe the GDPR is a little bit like a prince in form of a frock that wants to be kissed by a software engineer so that it's really it's really, I don't know, it comes to life and some, some structure unfolds. So I thought maybe I'm probably getting this whole thing completely wrong because implement in a law sense probably means you have approval processes and signatures and stamps and whatnot. But what if happens if I just try to read this thing as a software engineer would read it and treat it as the product manager's specification of the software? Um, what would happen? So I thought I might do this and hopefully I can turn the whole thing somehow into code. So now, I think what we've covered before, I mean, it's kind of like sane requirements or something. What follows now is a bit of uh, like ways, I believe, you can build software to make sure things are relatively compliant with this law. It's still not uh, getting the fuzziness out of this, obviously, because law by nature is a bit fuzzy and it probably needs a bunch of real like uh, big aha decisions or something that really make clear uh, this is the way we interpret this because lawyers obviously fight with each other about certain things, but maybe we get various architectural principles right. I read the law, I read like everything I could find about it. There's, as I said, very little advice, except of course uh, this beautiful conference here last year it had a great talk about various privacy protection things also tailored towards data pipelines. I think of this nice guy sitting up there. Hello, so it's really great advice. I touch upon some of the things. Uh, you can hear it in much greater detail uh, in the YouTube uh, video of that presentation. Um, so GDPR, if you have to summarize it, you can look into Article 5. It's uh, like still very long and a big summary, but if you bring it down, I would kind of make these like three observations here. The first and most important thing you have to do is lawful processing. So basically what's allowed by default is nothing, and then there's always, there has to be this legal basis for everything you do, otherwise you're not allowed to do it. So that's what you got to check all the time. And then the second principle is data minimization. It's like you use for the processing only what you really need, nothing else you keep around all the time. And deletion, like you are able to delete everything. You have to delete it at some point. You never keep anything forever. And then of course accountability, that goes a lot like into this auditing. You actually have to prove that you did it wrong, uh, that you did it right, not the other person has to prove that you did it wrong. Sometimes you may be also accidentally be proving that you did it wrong, who knows. But uh, like the important thing here is the onus of proof is on you, the company, to prove everything. So you need logs of everything and be able to prove it and um, like also make careful decisions what kind of data you keep for proving and when do you have to delete the proofs and so on. It's uh, yeah, getting complicated. So lawful processing, as I said. This is exactly what you're allowed to do by default. 
absolutely nothing, unless, of course, there are a few exceptions when you can do things. And like the basic one you probably all know is you consent to getting a newsletter, and then you get the newsletter, and if you don't, then you don't. So consent is one way uh, to be able to use data. Um, but it's not the only one, as you might uh, imagine. There's others, like contractual agreements. That's kind of, you give, I don't know, I would call it an implicit consent by saying, I want the service of the company. Like, I don't know, it's sign up with Flickr or something. It manages your images. Probably you gave kind of implicit consent somehow so that it manages your images. It's necessary for the contractual agreement with uh, the customer to deliver the service, so you are allowed to process the data. There's uh, another interesting one. It's legitimate interest. I think one very difficult one. It's, it goes kind of like if the company has a legitimate interest, it's allowed to do that, and then there's kind of a risk uh, assessment behind it. Like you are only allowed to have a legitimate interest if the risk is low for the customer, and if it's really a legitimate interest and not something you like try to bolt on to be allowed to do something. Uh, it's very hard to find examples about it. I guess it's something around, I don't know, IT security stuff, fraud protection. That's why I would see it. So it's probably, I mean, somewhere it says, I think, direct marketing can be this. I would be careful and f ask a lawyer before. Um, <laughs> so it could be difficult. And then there's, of course, legal obligations. Like there's all sorts of other laws that trump the GDPR in terms of data protection. So if you're working in a regulated industry, probably you have lots of these. And then also, like every company, I guess, has these. For instance, if you look into yeah, Handelsgesetzbuch, so German business law, there's, if you had a company, you have to keep all sorts of records for a longer period of time and not, not allowed to delete them. Otherwise, you, know, you couldn't prove anymore that you didn't cheat on your taxes and these kinds of things. So various laws can, can make you keep things. And then if you look a bit into it, all these things seem to be like not just yes or no but maybe they are yes for some customers and no for others. Like it's obvious for consent. Um, there you may have one, people, one person consenting, the other not, but it's actually possibly true for other things as well. For instance, if you have a complex product landscape, then people may have some of your products, but not all of them. So you cannot, or yeah, like you have different contractual agreements, and like the full set of the customers of your company, you can petition it somehow by the, the various products they have and can only do certain processing for people who have certain products, but not for others. Maybe you also have legitimate interests, which you can somehow argue like for one person, it's, it's true, but then another person objects against it. I think there is this special uh, objection right that you have, so maybe this goes away. Same for legal obligation. Maybe you have a legal obligation to source somebody's data, but then the other person lives in another country and it doesn't apply, or maybe the other person is too young, still a kid, and it doesn't apply, I don't know. So maybe all these things are customer specific. And what I thought, that's basically my way, how I would treat this is before, if you run jobs in there, you just process the data and it's done, and somebody else has to put the stamp on it, like this is okay, kind of by design. But to me, the whole thing before looked a little bit like you have to build some sort of authorization system where you say, like you probably know it from a newsletter, you don't just fetch the list of all emails and send out newsletters, you f beforehand filter for consent. You could actually do that with all the other legal bases as well, where you could say, um, I have this one table where I manage all my complexity, I talk with my lawyer about it in depth, and I define exactly who, whose personal data I can process in which way. And then I have this kind of authorization mechanism. Every job that I want to run, it first asks, like, give me the list of customers. I'm really allowed to do that with that. And then I kind of join that with the, with the customer data I have, and I throw away all the records that I'm not allowed to process. Um, so that would be my one learning that I had. Of course, that may require some pre-processing, so you have to make sure that for all your data sets that you're somehow processing, you're able to identify to which person it belongs, and ideally very easily and without many complex joints and so on, so that people really know when I'm having a record here, I have to know it's personal data. I don't have to have to think about it or something. It's always, I know if it's personal data, there's this pseudonym or whatever in there, I can, I can uh, process it uh, and beforehand filter that uh, with, this, with this particular authorization table. There's another topic, data minimization. Um, the first part of it is very hard to get right, I guess, in general, because it just says use whatever data you need, but not more but who defines what data you need. So that requires really careful and subjective planning for everything you do. Um, but then it says implement deletion everywhere also kind of, because uh, like you're not allowed to keep anything forever. And uh, probably you would want to, because like who knows what happens, maybe you did a mistake somewhere and you want to keep the data around so that you can fix that mistake and rerun everything and then it gets better. 
Um, maybe you want to keep the data around just because new things, new requirements, new stuff that you want to do pop up later, and you want to repurpose that data for uh, that particular thing, but uh, it's not allowed. So um, basically, you have to get away from that idea of having some kind of immutable data set sitting somewhere to uh, probably it sits there for a time, but after a while it has to go. Um, this is also something that kind of like you have to do on a regular basis. Uh, all sorts of events that appear, like somebody wants to have his data deleted, revokes his consent, and so on, might trigger this. There's also just the customer ends his contractual agreement, and then data minimization could mean you just throw away his data, because what do you need it anymore for? So all sorts of events might trigger deletion. Um, and what do you have to do? Uh, for all your like relational database management systems, like the MySQL database I spoke about before, it should be relatively easy to do. You have a schema. You ideally know where like, the persons in this database are when you have to delete a person. It, you should be able to come up with an SQL statement that removes this data, that just purges this ones and zeros from the face of Earth. Um, and you should be done. Of course, it could be complicated, but it's doable. For your pipelines, if you follow this uh, kind of idea of having the functional stuff uh, going on and having the immutable data sets everywhere, it might be more difficult. Um, marking something as deleted, as you would do in pure event sourcing, maybe doesn't really count, for sure. That's never counted with any lawyer I talked. Um, so you can't do that. Um, I see three, way out, uh, three ways out. First of all, just by default, you apply some sort of retention period, saying, I don't keep this stuff around for a long time. Like, if you keep it only for a few days or maybe a few weeks or so, everything should generally be fine, because you're throwing away the data relatively fast. Even if people ask for like, having their data deleted by this special article there, I think you have something like 30 days or so to react, so that should be cool if you throw away all the data all the time um, and don't keep it longer than you really need only for this kind of backup purpose. Like if you figured out your data processing jobs from yesterday, they failed, you can rerun it again, um, but not like the data sets from three years ago. You have them lying around just because you may want to do something with it. There could be other things you can do. Maybe at some point you generate something that you can count as anonymous. Like, for instance, you calculated the total number of customers at some point and just want to spit out that number. Then that number isn't personal data anymore, so you can keep it around forever. You can put it onto PowerPoint slides, and uh, then it's fine. Um, it's, of course, always like a stretch sometimes to be really sure that something is anonymous because anonymization is a very difficult topic. Um, some people have the opinion that you just X out names and then everything is anonymous and then other people do these crazy re-identification attacks, you know it from Netflix. There's also this nice taxi ride data set I once saw where there were just taxi rides with GPS coordinates published and then somebody went and looked up celebrity pictures going like into cap or going into caps or out of caps, correlated that with the data set, identified a few celebrities and then could assign these taxi rides. And all of a sudden, it's not anonymous anymore. So bad for you. You probably would have to delete it then or get a fine or something. So this is something you got to be very careful about, particularly if it's about machine learning stuff that you want to do later on. So if you say my training data is anonymous, but it's very fine and granular, at some point, that could be a big risk for you if you didn't do that properly. There's a talk, I guess, uh, this evening uh, here, which is going into exactly that topic. I'm looking forward to it. There's like K-anonymity and, and uh, T-closeness and whatnot. Maybe even differential privacy, who knows. Um, but anyway, so we have that. And then finally, the only thing we can do is clean up after us. That's where uh, Mr. Uh, Albertson's nice uh, talk comes in. So there's, there's various things you can do. Basically, rerun all your pipelines all the time and recompute everything after cleaning up your initial source data and then everything is cleaned afterwards. That could be very computationally expensive, obviously, but maybe the only thing you can do. Um, and it's also easy because it just needs the code that you currently have. It only works, of course, if you have a proper like, workflow tool in place, uh, like the Luigi thing that our data scientists use, so that uh, you can rerun really everything and now it fits together. Maybe you got to run some cleaning jobs uh, and uh, that may make it a bit easier because you don't recompute everything, but still you write all the files again and if that's really huge, then that might be a problem as well because then you write petabytes of data again. Not that we would have that problem, but maybe others have it. Um, other things you could do is maybe factor out uh, the personal data, like the really the identifying data, um, and then define pseudonyms for various parts of the other data sets that you have. And then if you can manage that one table down there as the table you keep current and the table that you just X outlines if you don't need them anymore, 
then maybe the other data sets, even though you didn't delete anything, are anonymous enough uh, to count as deleted. That's, uh, I guess, also very difficult, but it allows you to make that decision locally for this data set only. So in, uh, like the owner of a particular data set here could decide that even though uh, there has to be something deleted, I don't do it in this data set because like, it's reasonably anonymous. Difficult to argue sometimes, I think. Much easier, I guess, is, uh, like from a legal perspective, this uh, encryption key join table or lost key pattern as it's sometimes called. So you really say for the various things, I always encrypt all the details about a person except for the stuff that I can really delete. And then uh, as I delete the encryption keys, the stuff is also going away. That is accepted by most lawyers. I have also seen some people who say, no, you got to really delete things. Get out of your ivory tower encryption. Hmm, I don't know. Uh, so that's also something you might have to check if your organization really accepts something like that. So with that, uh, I want to conclude a few minutes over the time. I'm sorry. Uh, compliance is code. That is what I hope we can build uh, and also what we can build internally inside the company because that's kind of the philosophy of Solaris Bank to its outside partners that ideally as much as possible should be coming from just using the API in the right way in the processes that are in there. And... Uh, I don't think we're there yet for the GDPR, but I hope that someday I will understand it well enough to build it properly. Uh, any questions? Sorry, we don't have uh, yeah, time right four. now for more questions. Uh, maybe you can yes, see please. Dominic later. <laughs>